Hi, I'm Craig Delaney and welcome to Home Chat and welcome to our fourth instalment, our bonus instalment on footings, foundations and slab design. You might think it's the driest series you'll ever watch, but certainly from the investment in your home, one of the biggest investments you're ever going to have in your life, this is certainly a series of episodes we believe certainly worth watching. Today I'm joined again by John Whitehead, Senior Design Engineer, FMG. Hi John, how are you? Yeah, well Craig. So today we're going to, to talk about, I guess, uh, all the all the things that go wrong, all the things that people hear about in the industry, the controversial terms that are around at the moment, like heave. Uh, talk a little bit more about trees. Talking talking about why slabs fail. So I guess, John, what we might do is we might start off with this term at the moment, uh, at the moment that that is being really uh, spread around the industry a lot. It's in uh, blogs, it's in uh, discussion columns that are going on, and that's heave. What is heave? Well, as we've already talked about in the uh, rest of the series, soils are sensitive to moisture. So heave is effectively when the soil under your house has taken in more water than when you built on it and it's actually expanding up. So we went through a, a dry season for quite a few years in Melbourne, which everybody knew about. The dams were down to 27% capacity. Yep. We were talking about desalination plants around Melbourne. Yep. Now we're getting rainfall again. So oh, yeah. all that clay is, is swelling. Is that what you're saying? Effectively, that's what's happened. Yeah, we've broken the drought. Um, we're getting more uh, moisture into the ground. Um, and it's just uh, expanding. So in, in today's designs, we're seeing a lot of, again, those board piers being used to, to bind the house and protect it, to sort of steady up that, that floating of the slab, are we? That's it. What we're doing is we're trying to get to soil that's not going to be affected as much. Um, with the changes in rainfall and moisture content. Now, for, for people that have uh, constructed houses a while ago in the drought, talking about our old friend from before, aggie drains yep. or agricultural drains, would that be a good way to, to handle that excessive moisture? Um, anything you can do to dewater your site um, or, or create a stable moisture um, regime with, around your house um, is, is a good idea. Trees. Now we talked about trees before, but the reality is trees are, as a mechanism to cause mischief mm -hmm. around a slab, very underrated, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, if you buy a house and in the nature strip you've got a tiny tree that's maybe five years old, you're not going to see the effects of that for some time, but it's something we need to consider in the design. It's certainly something that can affect um, the front of your house. What about a row of trees, say big uh, gum trees or pine trees that might be two or three blocks over from a house? They can, even though they're sort of out of the road, they can still have a serious impact, can't they? Absolutely. Um, trees take moisture out of the, out of the soil. Um, and as we've already spoken about, it's the moisture content that um, is determining the shrink or swell of your soil. Because water moves under the ground, I guess just like the ocean where we have a, a flat surface and we have hills and valleys under the ocean, the water's moving along those hills and valleys. Absolutely, and if you happen to be at a, a point where it's deep or there's abundance of it all year round, that's where the trees are going to come and get it. And why do slabs fail? What's, what's a classic example of a slab failing? Slabs, um, slabs fail by movement. Um, it's all due to movement. Most failure um, that you see on slabs is due to the plaster um, on your walls. So if you see things opening up, if you see things um, cracking within your walls, that's where you're going to see it because plaster is quite sensitive to that. Movement um, is caused by a myriad of things, um, as we've already touched about. Um, the moisture content below the house, if you get differential moisture from one corner to the next. Um, Poor slab design is another uh, Now, big one. speaking of poor slab design, re the reality is pouring a slab in the rain, that's that's a bit of a no-no, isn't it? It's not ideal. Um, and in fact, um, I think it's specified within the codes you shouldn't do it. Occasionally you do see slabs being sort of uh, worked or, or poured or sort of finished off, but really we're getting a lot of excess water hitting the slab and we get that sort of chalkiness. Yeah, you get that dusty and um, finish on top. Now, it's not all disaster. Um, it's not um, necessarily meaning that your house is going to fail if that happens, if they're halfway through the pour and the heavens open, it happens. Um, however, it should be avoided if, if at all possible. Strength of slab to build on. Another interesting subject. Some people say, look, we, we want you to have the slab sit there for a month before we walk, start to start the framing process yeah. on, a, on a house. Other people say, well, we want our house built as quickly as we possibly can. When should the framing or the above ground works start on a, on a slab? 
Our advice is five to seven days. Um, we understand that you can't wait a month, ideally. In an ideal world, you would wait the month to get the full strength out of the concrete. However, we live in a practical world. A week um, is usually more than enough. And I guess in the, in the west and the north, where we've got a lot of clays, a lot of uh, water moving underneath a slab, the surface can look quite dry, but the underneath is still going to be very green and wet. Absolutely, and that's the thing. Um, if you can't see it, you don't think it's a problem. Um, it's the hidden dangers. And, and that load being carried uh, around the outside of a slab, we are putting a lot of pressure on concrete, which still under the surface is quite green. Absolutely, yeah. When we look at uh, internal walls, and we mentioned about uh, load-bearing walls earlier on, now in waffle pod uh, slabs, in, in larger house designs or wider, uh, wider house designs, we still need to have some load-bearing walls, some extra footings to protect a slab. Absolutely, and that's something the engineer will be designing when when you go ahead with your design. We see in our fresco areas or large uh, rear areas for double storey houses, outside entertaining areas, again we see a cracking happen there on a fairly regular basis where the, the actual uh, brick pillars, which might be in that al fresco area, are freestanding and they're not tied back to the house. Absolutely, and if it's supporting your roof, you will get some differential movement. You've got a tiny pad in um, trying to work in conjunction with um, the rest of your house effectively. So, so the way that we designed for that um, is to tie them all back into the slab or in highly reactive areas it's better to have that as part of your slab, the whole alfresco. Otherwise it's kind of like a little uh, buoy floating in the ocean, it's, it's not tied to anything and it's just a recipe for disaster. Absolutely, so get that tied in um, somehow. In looking at, um, uh, again, in designer slabs, now we touched on before about being conservative or aggressive with slab designs. If we wanted to be conservative with a slab design, what's the sort of things that we should be doing? Looking at the size of the steel uh, that we've got in the slab, looking at how much steel is being used in the slab, strength of concrete. Are those other areas where, again, it's kind of borderline, which we should have been conservative rather than aggressive in, in what was done? Um, Conservative design is statistically, again, everything's based on statistics within the design code. So anything you can do to increase the stiffness is going to give you a higher um, probability of non-failure. Um, so things like increasing the steel is a good idea. If you're doing a waffle slab and you've got the maximum rio that you can put in it, it's maybe worth looking at going to a raft slab um, to give you that extra stiffness to mitigate any movement. One other thing with uh, board piers too is that there is uh, times when even board piers aren't enough. Um, I had to explain to somebody the other day what a screw pole is. Would you like to take a moment to explain why screw poles are used over board piers? Uh, screw piles are usually used where we um, have very sandy soil which means that you can't put board piers in. Um, they also go a lot deeper um, and they also have the advantage um, of being able to be put within the slab. Um, with board piers it's effectively a stilt that you sit the um, slab directly on. Uh, with the screw pile it actually penetrates into the slab and allows um, movement, um, allows the movement to still take place um, and keep that connection with the, with the deeper footing. Gee John, so much to consider again, thanks for some great advice. So there you have it, the bonus segment on troubleshooting and some of the, some of the things that we need to also take into consideration when we're designing and, and building a, a slab that's, that's right for your home.